Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. So this is the second lecture of Mark on quiver and um, parabolic quiver whole liquid polynomials. Okay, so we're really kind of on lecture 1.5 because I was kind of in the, um, so let me just, so what was our data we had? Um, um, a quiver. We had a sequence of, of nodes and we had a sequence of dimensions. Sequence of positive integers. And then we, from, from, the, from the back to the front, we put down a certain amount of dimensions at each vertex and um, and from this data, we created this um, this uh, this variety, the Lustig um, um, convolution um, diagram, and and then we had one more piece of data we added to it. Um, the sequence of dominant weights. So mu k is a dominant weight for. GL AK. So you can imagine that we are stacking these weights, sort of making piles of weights at each vertex. The vertex is controlled by this, and these are, these are the weights that we're placing at these different vertices. So, we, so what we did is we had this variety, and from this mu dot, we made a, a vector bundle on. Um, on W, and then we um, took uh, Euler, characteristic, Euler characteristic of global sections and got this infinite series. It's generally an infinite series. Um, and we expanded it into, um, okay, so I need to say that from this, from this data, we got a graded vector space V dot. And um, where this dot lives in the is a Dinkin node, and so we have to um, then we take this 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 thing this thing ha uh, had a grading. I'm sorry, it had an action of the um, the pro the product of the um, the GLs acted on everything. And we had a torus TQ1, which had a copy of the uh, multiplicative group of the complex numbers, uh, non-zero complex numbers for each arrow. And it had, this, and so it's, its representation ring could be realized as the Laurent polynomials in, um, variables, there's one scaling variable for every arrow. And then they acted on the um, crib representation space by scaling the corresponding matrix space. So then this, this big series um, was, was a, a um, the character, or if you, if you well, it's a, um, if you take the, its character as a G, it has the action of G and this R, this uh, called the group script G was a G cross this torus. This is this is a, a big it's an infinite character, but it's but it's locally finite, so you can so you can make sense of your answer. And if you expand the, this this S lambda dot is the is the um, lambda lambda i is a um, is a dominant weight for G L V I. So that's going to be like a little sure polynomial, if you will, and um, at each vertex. So, so sure polynomials in different sets of variables, one set of variables for every um, node, and then we have this coefficient polynomial. And it, ha it, it has one variable for every arrow, and we call this the um, quiver Paul Littlewood series. 
misty quiver Casca shoji called on you. And um, I was in the middle of telling you uh, this, this, some special cases of this. And so we had, we were still um, dealing with one node. So Q is a, a single node and a single loop. We were still in the middle of that case. And uh, I was telling you, um, I guess I stopped when, when we were um, at the place in the story where I uh, met Masato. Um, so, um, oh, so in the case where the quiver is this, this, this uh, single, single node right here, um, at some point we got to the point where um, all of these, um, all of these weights are rectangles. And uh, we, we, we actually, but but we're, we're actually, I, I want to make a statement that's true in general here. So this might be make it more exciting for some of you. Um, so if you set all these variables, so um, th there's only one variable for this because there's one arrow for this quiver, and if we set this variable to zero, there's only one. Only one note's only one. There's only one uh, highest weight here. We still have a we still have a, a pile of partitions at this vertex. If we set the, that one variable to one, we get a little Richardson coefficient giving you. And what what this really is is that this mu dot is really the. Um, is telling you the highest weight of a levy, um, and you're inducing that that irreducible in the levy up to the group, and then taking the lambda -th coefficient of that. So it's really a levy induction um, multiplicity. Um, but um, so this this uh, algebraic sort of induction restriction sort of reciprocity tells you that that this is this thing is a little Richardson coefficient. So what you have here is a, a bunch of polynomials, which are graded analogs of little Richardson coefficients. And um, so that's um, something that's kind of interesting about, about this single loop case. Um, oh, and so um, uh, Takeshi Ikeda, he asked me a question after the lecture last the time, and I thought that more of you should have been asking the same question. Um, in my in my list of stuff that came up, in the case of um, new dot, all rectangles. One of the thing we got was um, tensor product of Kirillov Rechitikin crystals. The, so the, if you the, the if you take the um, if you restrict the the character to the to the finite GL, and then you get a graded, you get a graded, um, you get a polynomial, and you ask yourself, why am I getting a polynomial that's appearing in this other in this other situation? It's like, great question. Everyone should have asked that question. So the answer is that. Um, so I mentioned that there is this um, this this gadget here. Um, this W had had a projection to in, had, in, in this case, it has a projection to, to just matrices. So GL, some, some GLN. And the image of this projection was a nilpotent consciously class closure. And Lustig says, you can embed simultaneously all of these nilpotent consciously class closures into the affine Grassmannian in a way that um, that each one of those um, adjoint orbit closures are are open and dense inside corresponding Schubert varieties in the um, in the affine Grassmannian. And so, and so, okay. Well, you say, well, so so what? Well, the so what is because if you consider Demis the corresponding Demizur characters, 
and these are and you, you get these G invariant Demizur characters, and it was already known at the time. So it, that that these Demis, these particular Demizur characters were tensor product of Kirillov Vesutikin um, um, modules. So um, that explains. Uh, so without the, it, with, without the, the the vector bundle twisting, that explains why you should expect such a thing to happen. That case is the case when all the rectangles have the same width. Um, but when you start twisting with the, these vector bundles, it's not clear at all why why uh, why why you should keep getting these kinds of things on the nose. Um, but 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 at least in that special case, it's sort of quote unquote obvious that you should get you should get that kind of answer. Um, but there's certain things. There's certainly lots of things that this kind of geometry doesn't explain. For example, um, I noticed this level rank duality for these things. If you have these, the, all the this, all these, the product of all these rectangles. If you transpose all the rectangles and you transpose the the, um, so if you if you just throw the transpose on everything here, well, it's pretty common knowledge that you're going to get the same coefficient. So so. Um, but if you think about the, the, the geometry where this came from, this is a completely different world. Um, and what happens to the polynomial is it just, it just gets reversed. And we saw the, the skeleton of this in the single, the, the single rows and the single columns cases of KR. Those two cases are exactly the same way. You have the Casca polynomial and then the, so the, one, the, the one with the grading backward. Um, but, but that sort of, this sort of, level rank duality thing is completely unexplained by this geometry. It's completely unexplained by the affine crystal theory. It's just something that's sort of obvious if you're a combinatorialist when you, but, but it's, not, it's not told you by the, by the big picture it comes from. So anyway, um, that was a good question. <laughs> um, okay. Why, why the KR? Okay. Um, Ah, yes, now we get to back to Professor Okado. So, um, so, so this situation of tensor product of KR crystals um, is part of a gigantic, a gigantic, uh, a gigantic family of things. So there's this um, Atayama, Kuniba, Okado, Takagi. And I'm going to make a, a type D Dinkin diagram out of them. Yamada, Dasuhiko Yamada, and Suboy. So, in this, in these two um, amazing papers, um, these gentlemen um, formulate this. X equals M conjecture, where X means uh, a KR character graded by energy function. So it's a, a, this is a collection of polynomials. And over here, we have another collection of polynomials coming from the fermionic formula, fermionic. And I'm not qualified to tell you where they got this, some sort of beta onsets thing maybe, um, but, um, so, so this is just, um, it, it's probably 98% um, theorem by now, but um, uh, at the time it was, it was completely uh, wide open when, when I um, met Professor Okado. And uh, so this is, this is just, I just want to shine a spotlight on this as one of, one of these brilliant kinds of things. It was just, um, I mean, I'd never seen any formula like the fermionic formula for just 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 amazing formula. Um, and uh, through all this whole process, um, I, I learned a lot of uh, folklore concerning affine crystal theory from P Professor Okado that uh, I would have uh, that, that was great, greatly helpful. Um, so thank you very much for teaching me about affine crystal theory. Um, oh yeah, so. Um, so, so, th so this, so we did prove this. So, um, so with Tola Kirilov uh, for type A, um, 
on a shilling. And me, we, we proved this. I don't know when it was. Something like probably with plus or minus one year of that. Um, and so um, for, for, for full rectangles generality, it was, it was known in the, the Rose case was known by Kirill Vashitikin modulo some serious technical issues, but, 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 they, but they knew what was going on for single rows, but this is, um, so uh, yeah, so that, that, so that uh, I'm, I'm sticking to type A things because I'm doing uh, quiver things. Quiver things are really all based on type A technology. And you can arrange the little arrows in interesting ways, but when you're actually working with them, of course, it's all type A stuff. Oh, well, we're not out of the woods yet. We're still dealing with the tensor products of these rectangles. So, so, um, so there's another, there's another, at the time, there's another famous, so these weren't the only Q analog or T graded analog of little Richardson coefficients. There's another one called LLT polynomials. So last good. Leclerc, Tibon, polynomials. And they're, and they're a graded a analog, a graded version of little Richardson coefficient was um, certain parabolic cosinon lucid polynomials for the affine symmetric group. So these are not also not stupid objects. And, um, and so I had a conjecture um, that landed my paper with Wayman, whatever that was, around, around this. Um, conjecture that for rectangle case, when all of the all the things are multiplying are rectangles, um, the two kinds agree. So parabolic Tosca. or X formula or M formula or uh, equals LLT. This is conjecture, conjecture, and is proved by um, Gronowski and Heyman around 2011, I suppose, seven. Whenever it was, <laughs> Ian Gronowski. Mark Heyman using um, some so hybrid bases of um, affine Heck algebra. And um, so now we are ready to leave the world of rectangles, I think, and get to the general picture for still, we're still on a single, qu single loop quiver. Sorry, um, it's a long story. And it's a, but this is a really good time for telling this story because, uh, well, you'll see. <laughs> right, so, so we're still on single loop here, but now um, general partitions, except the whole time I've been assuming that when we're stacking these partitions at every vertex, when you make the pile, the whole pile is a dominant weight. So that was this dominance condition that I um, talked about last time. So for these general sequence of rectangles, that, but I mean, sorry, general sequence of, of partitions, but they have to stack together to be to be dominant. That's that's the data we have here. And um, so there, there was a so the, there was a, the vanishing conjecture that what are characteristics characteristics I was talking about. Um, there's a corresponding vanishing conjecture, and that, in this case, in this special case, that conjecture is due to um, Rare. He told me about this this problem actually, um, and uh, and so he had he had an Invencionis paper where he proves it for rectangles. Um, now, of course, he also does it in general type, but in type A, what he proves it for is rectangles. So that's so he he proves the vanishing theorem in that in that rectangles case, but he didn't know how to do it when your partition was kind of ragged, you know, not not a nice, uh, they weren't nice uh, nice rectangles, and um, so in January, 
So 2023, January, Shukato announced a proof um, of this vanishing conjecture. And he actually proved a bunch of more stuff. Um, he proved that uh, geometrically by, by vanishing, uh, cohomology vanishing proved the positivity of these um, Cadland functions, which are, uh, which, are, which, are, which are more general than these parabolic Koskas. So, um, so he, he, he uh, announced the proof of that. And I talked to him yesterday uh, evening, trying to gain some details about how that went. Um, so that's a very so this is a kind of a good time to be giving this this talk because this this conjecture that uh, was made like twenty something years ago. Um, this is two thousand seven, <laughs> so um, it just now got proved, and also just within the last couple of years. So um, so I always I so I was saying that like there's always a pair of problems here. There's a geometric proof of positivity, and there's a combinatorial proof. The combinatorial proof tells you a set of objects and, and what power of T to put with each object to make, to make the polynomial. And so, that, so, I, so, um, so I had this um, conjecture, so, so fancy tableau uh, conjecture. <laughs> Metabolizable tableau, and um, th this kind of tableau, like I, I, I have no idea how to prove that these things, th the number of these things, is a little rich Richardson number. The only proof I know right now is that someone proved that these are the this is the that these are the correct answer. I know, I know no direct proof of this of this fact. Um, so this theorem um, by um, Really brilliant work of um, Blasiak, Morse, and Pun. I think this is like 2020. It's like within the last couple of years. And I don't know whether this is embarrassing or, or promising, but this, so th this conjecture, like every, like, like most of Heyman's students since that time, came and asked me, have you made any progress on the conjecture? And I had to say, sorry, no, I don't have any idea. Um, one of those students was, was Jonah Blasiak. And, but, but, but back at the time, I knew all this affine crystal theory for type A. And I just, I thought it was not strong enough to solve this conjecture. I was exactly wrong. These guys, they used all the technology that I knew all about. And they proved, <laughs> proved the conjecture. So it's like, but it, it was it was a two to force. But I mean, uh, what can you say? I was just exactly wrong. And it, all this technology was already uh, well, maybe not quite true. That they they used this online stuff, but but a lot of the stuff they did, I, I already I, I had knew the technology, but not the clever way to apply it. So um, yeah, so that was. I don't know whether to be happy or sad about it. Cl clearly happy, but um, yes. Yeah, so okay, finally we get to the cyclic quiver. So Q naught. So just think of this as being the energy mod R. So if R node cyclic quiver and just have an arrow goes from each, you have just an. Your arrows just each vertex has a directed arrow to the, the next one, and so the two node case is the one um, that gives you. Um, so Shoji so, so made lots of polynomials, um, and but but this something called the limit symbol kind, and I think he had a couple of a couple of variants of these, but one of those was. Was was this one, and um, so I guess he his his original paper is from two thousand four. Um, this his in this two node case. Oh, oh, I should say that these are all all single rows. Um, 
no partitions, just all single, all, all single rows. So he connected his polynomials with intersection cohomology. This and this is joint with um Dakar. This is from um, 2018. And uh, for general general R, these polynomials were defined by Finkelberg and Yonov. I already talked about talk, talked about at the beginning. Um, so they they defined they defined the um, these cyclic quiver version of um, Kaskashogi polynomial. Um, I suppose I should have been making the board go up and down, but I'm not so smart. Um, so, and they conjectured they conjectured. Um, that in two nodes. Um, so, he, as I said, I, I, what I was, what we were doing in the first lecture was copying um, and generalizing Finkelberg, uh, Finkelberg for or Lustig, whoever. I mean, and um, well, mostly these guys. And and um, and so when when they did it, and they conjectured that, that in the two node case, that you, you get uh, Shoji polynomials. They conjectured that, and it was proved by Shoji. And uh, oh yeah, so um, also in this paper, Finkelberg Yonov, they proved that the variety W, which I erased, the the Lustig convolution diagram, um, they proved that it was for being a split, and with that. What that gives you for free is some positivity. So um, they also get a geometric positivity when um, the the uh, partitions are uh, strictly dominant. So um, a regular dominant. So, so all the parts of the partition are different. So um, that's, a, but, and then they conjectured, they conjectured positivity, they conjectured positivity in general. And that's open. Um, although uh, Shu has some, uh, Shu Kato has some ideas on how, how to do this case, actually. He was telling me about them yes, yesterday. Um, there's a couple more cases where we know what to do. Like, so, so for, for, um, so now I'm going to talk about, so for, if Q has all components, um, uh, cyclic or paths, then in my paper with Dan Orr, we have a conjecture for a tableau conjecture. It's the same kind of fancy tableau as as, as uh, back here, but uh, for for quivers that are directed that consist whose components are directed cycles or paths, this 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 thing appears to work. Um, so we have this same kind of conjecture out there, but um, we don't know the technology to that. See, that allows us to move between different nodes. And so we don't know how to prove it at the moment. Um, okay. So I think I've gotten out of my system. Um, well, there's also some connections with um, wreath hollow with polynomials, but I'm not going to bother saying that for now. And I'm going to stop and reset. And now we're on lecture two. So, um, the real lecture two. So part one was about these these symmetric series that go on forever. They have finitely many x variables, and now we're going to do symmetric functions. Um, and at the risk of being too babyish, I'm going to do these 
baby vertex operators, but I'm going to do them sort of Garcia style. And now most of you are probably have seen the uh, the power sum versions of everything, but I'm going to do sort of a more. I like this other way of doing it because it's more obviously integral. Um, you're, you're secretly working with functors, um, so it's just I just like it better. So anyway, um, for if I have our typical kind of triples, if I have our Dinkin node, our positive integer, and our weight, I'm going to define um, an operator. So the space that we're going to act on is the tensor power of symmetric functions that has one copy for each vertex. And we're going to work over the field um, that has uh, all the arrow variables. So, um, so we're, we're going to define this op operator here. So I was originally told when, when um, told that there was going to be like a, a bunch of students in the audience and I should make a, a lecture that was, that was appropriate for that level. And so th this, this part of it is, is something you could just start now and just try to start uh, just working out the details of what I'm saying. So, um, so symmetric functions, um, Over over this field are, are what okay, abstractly they're just they're a polynomial ring with with distinguished distinguished generators in every positive integer degree with a certain Hopf structure. But um, usually you can't see of it concretely um, as a series and countably many variables x and x two and so on. Um, that are that are symmetric. So I'll just say invariant under S infinity, and um, and I'll say bounded and bounded in the total degree. So you just allow yourself series that are symmetric and bounded in degree, and that's what a concrete realization of this abstract ring of symmetric functions. Um, so you can think of even so in reality the, the, these variables don't exist, but it's handy to think about them as existing when you're when you're doing computations. Um, so here's some notation. So we'll call omega of z um, just one over one minus z, and so omega is like is like uh, exponential. So what it, it's really it's really the symmet symmetric algebra functor. That's what it is. Um, So if you have this one-dimensional vector space, take symmetric algebra, then it's character will be like that. Um, now here is an important. Note. So this I'm, I'm really defining things. I'm defining my notation here. So omega of minus w. Well, the, omega is like exponential. So this is one over um, omega w, and so that's one over one over one minus w. So that's one minus w. It's a reciprocal of the other one. Um, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll say more things about this in a second. And, and of course, you know, if you have omega z plus w, well, that's omega of z times omega of w. That's going to be, you know, one, one minus z, one, one minus w. Um, and now, we'll write capital X for little x1 plus little x2 plus da da da. And of course, the X's don't really exist. We pretend that pretend they exist. And then we write stuff like this, omega of um, U X. So U is just some sort of parameter. And then, well, what is that? Well, that's, let's just follow the rules. That's capital X is the sum of the X, little X I's. Well, this is exponential. So this is the product of omega of U X I. And that's just the product of one over one minus u x i. And the only reason I put the u in there is so that we can see obviously see the grading. And so if we can just 
gathered by powers of um, U, we of course get the one row homogeneous symmetric functions. So, yeah, that, this is just a graded. Um, and um, similarly, so, so Sumi Masen, if this is stuff that you've known for your whole life, oh, I didn't really want to do that, whatever. I wanted to make the board go halfway up, but. I'm really kind of defining notation, really. Um, and so. Well, this is minus the other one. So this is one over that one. So this is a product over I of one minus U X I. And this is equal to the sum of uh, e to the k elementary symmetric function k. Okay, so um, ah, and to try to get back on more familiar ground, um, the power sums. So usually these vertex operators are written in terms of power sums, and so I need to use them. And here's sort of the key. Identity, which um, is that omega of x is the exponential of the sum over r rank to one of pr of x over r u to the. Um, no, I didn't put a u in there. That's fine. It's like this. I'm going to put a u here and then put u to the r here. Just like that. Somehow feels more comfortable when you have that gradient parameter in there. I, it's not really necessary, but it makes me feel it makes me feel more comfy. So maybe it'll make, make you feel more comfy. Okay. Um, so now let's talk about the hop structure. So um, uh, the antipode. So um, this is a graded. Great preserving algebra homomorphism from symmetric functions to itself. And it just, um, it's induced by this. So you can think of this omega as being a generating function for all the homogeneous. The homogeneous, I should have said, are um, even over the integers, it's the polynomial, polynomial generators. Um, algebraically independent. So if you if you have an algebra homomorphism, in, you're, it's enough to know where the, these generators go, and um, the answer is just this. Just the, when you put the minus inside of these things, it's called a plethistic minus. Instead of instead of doing the symmetric algebra, you're doing sort of this universal causal uh, complex, something like the resolution, something like that. If you want to think of it that way. Um, but it, you, this, this, you just throw this minus sign. So like if you, if you have some kind of series, um, our notation for it is this. This is, this is notation for apply the, apply the antipode, throw the minus. And, um, and so if you just look at our series that we have, what, what this says, if this is graded, it sends HK to negative one to the K, EK for all. K rating to one. So that's what it does. And if just for the record, because you probably love power sums, it sends each power sum to minus power sum. And uh, now, ah, it's a tensor product. So you could have just the abstract tensor product, or you could have, you could think that. The first tensor factor is x variables and the second tensor factor is y variables. So then f tensor g, we write as f of x, g of y. That's just how we're gonna write, how we're gonna write that. And then um, the co-product.
our notation is that f goes to f of x plus y. So what this is supposed to remind you of is if you have some symmetric function, it, it, you're, you're supposed to plug in x1, x2, and so on to make your symmetric function. Well, to do the coproduct, just plug in x1, x2, and so on, and also plug in y1, y2, and so on. So you plug in, you uh, plug in into f both x1, x2, and so on, and y1, y2, and so on. Of course, this doesn't really make any sense because after all, those, those little variables don't exist. But what happens if we take a power sum and plug in this? Well, what happened with the power sum? We just raised, we, we, took, we took each variable, raised it to the rth power and summed over that. So if you have y's in there, we'll just get another stuff with y's too. And so we'll just get this. Which PR of X plus PR of Y. But with this XY business, what is this? PR of X is PR tensor one, and PR of Y is one tensor, one tensor PR. So the PR is uh, primitive. The, the, it's, it's kind of handy to be able to just plug stuff in um, like that. It, it really helps in certain situations to understand what's going on. Um, okay, so that's the coproduct. And then we have the hull pairing. And it's just, um, I haven't told you what sure functions are, but they're or at lambdas in your partitions. So this blackboard font Y is Young's lattice of partitions. So just the, orth the sure functions are or orthonormal. And um, one thing you learn when you're learning vertex operators or, or even anything in life, especially in physics, is that always do things with generating functions. It's always easier if you use generating functions. So, well, every, every, every uh, pairing has a generating function. It's called a reproducing kernel. It's the sum of every basis element and the dual basis element. So, uh, so the, 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 the reproducing kernel of this is a summation over lambda of S lambda of X, S lambda of Y, and, uh, And the famous Cauchy formula says that this is the omega of x, y. So uh, more explicitly, it's the product over i and j going to one of one over one minus x, i, y, j. But see, you just have all the products of all the x and y's. So that's that alphabet into which you're plugging this uh, into this omega. So to get that. Okay. Um, we're almost to the end of the list of preliminary things a symmetric function need to do. So we, if, if F is a symmetric function, we need, um, we'll call F perp the adjoint to multiplication. So this is the um, adjoint, call out adjoint to multiplication by F. Um, so in one of the lectures, you saw that S mu perp on S lambda was written S lambda slash mu skew sure function. So this is th that, that notation, that's what it means. Um, and uh, of course, because you guys probably love power sums, the perp of the power sum is just R times the partial derivative with respect to the R power sum. So of course if you've seen, of course you've seen this one. You know you know and love this one. Um, I didn't know and love that one. I I was born with uh, this integral, this omega thing. Um, okay, and so uh, what's what's the definition of this? Well, if you want to, so the definition of 
adjoint just means that for all f g and h you want to act by this operator f perp that's how it's pronounced f perp or skew skew by f you hear people say stuff like that um well what is it so you act on something and then you had to tell what the answer is you have to pair with something else and this is by definition of course multiplication on the other side and um this is a hop pairing so um you have that you take the co-product of g and 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 uh, then and pair it with f tensor h so you're this is the this is the this is the tensor product of hall pairings with right here and so if you want to use sweet limitation you could sum over when you compute the co-product of the g you'd have the um the, the g1 here paired with f times the g2 here paired with h so if you want to write things that way you can do it um so here's an exercise um where if you want to grow in your ability to do do this kind of uh, garcia calls it manipulatorics multi messing with symmetric functions um by uh, symbolically so um so exercise Um, well, some of you might look at this and say, well, that's the definition, and it is, but you should just do it with your favorite basis element just to make sure you, you, you know, you understand. So, um, for all symmetric functions, F, F perp, F of X perp, acting on the Cauchy kernel. So maybe... By linearity, you, it's, it suffice to show it for f being a sure function. Can you do it for your sure function lambda? So this is, it's it's a, it's an easy exercise. So it's, it's a good good thing to start with. Um, is f of y times and that's almost by definition what it means to be ad, adjoint and this to be a Rubinian kernel, but just just. Just do it as a as a as a warm up exercise. Yeah. Um, okay. But whenever, but as I said, you shouldn't work with the general F. Well, you could, but you should really be working with the Cauchy kernel. You should be really work with the generating function of any basis you might think of. So, um, in fact, this is the, exactly the correct thing to, to think to think about to, to think to do. Whoops, going the wrong way. Oh, well, it's okay. So why perp with F when we could perp with the Cauchy kernel? So um, so let's let's take is that might have gotten a little bit low there. Let's take f of x to be um, omega of x z. So z is just another set of variables, um, and always when I perp always means um, with respect to x. Um, unless unless I say otherwise, so um, so well, let's plug in. Let's plug this into this formula here, and we get um, omega of x z perp applied to omega of x y equals what does it equal? What well, equals the function of y? What is that? That's omega of um, y z times omega of x y. So if you did your homework, then you, then you would then you say, okay, I put f equals to that, and I get this. So what I really need, um, what I really need is the commutation relation between multiplication and perping. So, um, and then I'll be able to get on with my life.
啊。I have another exercise. Now, of course, if you know how um, we're, we're perping by omega of x z, if you know how to do that on the Cauchy kernel, then morally you know how to do it on asymmetric function because you know how to do it on a basis. You have a generating function of the basis. You know you know how omega of x z perp acts. But on a particular so but so on a particular function, so this is the second exercise. So that omega of x z perp on your favorite function f of x is equal to nothing but f of x plus z for all f. So perping by omega, omega xz adds z to your, to your x. So now we just do this commutation relation. Let's commute. Let's see how omega of xz perp and multiplication by f Let's so take f a general multiplication operator. And let's compute its commutation. So to do that, we have to act on something else. We'll act on g of x. Okay, well, um, this, this f of x means, well, I wrote f of x, but what I mean is the the operator on symmetric functions that is left multiplication by f of x. This is left multiplication by f of x. This, um, um, so this is just f of x times g of x. And this exercise tells us if we perp by omega of x z, then I just change my argument x to x plus z. So these x, x's turn to x plus z's. Um, x plus z, you have x plus z. Um, but we know that this, this thing here is what happens if we acted by omega of xz perp on g of x? I'm just using the fact that perping by omega xz adds z to your argument, turns g of x and g of x plus z. Therefore, since it's true for all G, we have the commutation relation that omega of XZ perped. Uh, post composed with uh, doing F first, it's the same thing as um, multiplying by F of XZ after perping. As operators, on symmetric functions. So again, this F really stands for multiplication by F. Okay. So, um, and in particular, we don't want to put the F, we want to put the Cauchy kernel. So, um, so if we, if we put F, F of X, omega of X, Y, Then we get omega xz perp followed by multiplication by omega xy is equal to. Now they have to put the, the f is the f is omega xy. I have to put x plus z in there instead of x. This is omega x plus z and the y 
followed by um, the same perp thing. But remember this omega thing is exponential. So um, I can write this as omega of zy times omega of xy times uh, followed by perping by omega xz. So what this tells you is that you can, you can commute this, this omega xz perp past the multiplication by omega xy at the cost of this extra factor here. So you know, people from vertex operators say, oh yeah, you, you commute the annihilation operator past the uh, creation operators, you can get these little factors popping up. But in, in, in our world, all the factors, they all look the same. I mean, maybe that's true. I, I, I'm, just not, I'm just not experienced with the um, vertex operator world. Okay, so um, yeah, so as, as you can see, I'm, I'm, um, I'm cl clearly um, saving some important content for the next lecture. Um, so, the, so I will definitely get there by the end, by the end of the next lecture. I will have defined these these magic operators. Um, Okay, so I have to, um, so the next thing I'm gonna do is um, Bernstein operators. And uh, so I'm gonna define a bunch of graded endomorphism and symmetric functions, and these will create the sure functions. And I, probably you've seen these. Um, uh, you've, you've almost almost certainly you've seen these, but but that's okay. Um, so um, need some notation. Rho is the um, the staircase monomial x uh, or x uh, the vector n minus one n minus two down to zero, and uh, and z will be just Z went up to Zn. So I have to I have to make the sure polynomial. So J is anti-symmetrization of the symmetric group. And um, yes, it's, and um, R of Z is up to um, a monomial multiplication, the uh, the Vandermond. This product of I less than J of one minus zj over zi, and this is equal to z to the minus rho times the van der Laan. And, um, and for lambda and z to the n, we can define s lambda of z, to be the by alternate the the vol denominator times the alternate of um, z to lambda plus a rho. So this is the the by alternate formula sure for sure polynomial. So it's a sure polynomial when when lambda is dominant, um, when it isn't, uh, you get either zero or plus or minus another uh, sure polynomial. Um, I don't want to. Just um, so what I'm going to do next time is I'm going to just do a few lines of computation and make you a sure function, um, and uh, and then I'm going to mess with the operator a little bit and make you hall Littlewood symmetric function of um, the H kind, and then I'll mess it with a little bit more, and we'll get par the generating functions of parabolic Koskas. And then we'll combine it with quiver data stuff, and we'll get the uh, creation operators for for the quivers. So it's a good time to stop.
Any questions or comments? So you're going to describe the whole little program using this? Uh, yeah, so yeah, just uh, uh, it, it's it's you, you're going to recognize it. it you, you just have a different way of writing it. But like, I'm just going to use omegas and um, but yeah, I'm just and but um, that's that's what's going to happen. Yeah, so I, I, I hope I don't know if I how if I bored everyone with with this stuff, but I think this is useful tools. So that's why I'm saying it. Yeah. Uh, no more questions. Uh, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Uh, conference dinner at 5.30.